जय धारी माँ मम्मी जय धारी माँ जय धारी माँ हमारी ऑडियंसेस का स्वागत है वी वेलकम यू टू अनादर एपिसोड ऑफ बातचीत it's a transformative journey for all of us here at demonstrative learning aap sab ka swagat hai hamari aaj ki atithi major general en cardozo he makes courage sound and look very simple his entire journey is of courage honor humility we feel honored to be sharing this space with him talking to him getting his help bulate hain unko lekin unse pehle un par ek video dekhte hain courage is so pure and simple he makes it so pure and simple i ek video dekhiye sir ke डॉक्टर किरण बेदी वी ऑल नीड टू सोल्यूट यू No, you sir. Are the, you are the foremost and finest police officer this country no, has sir. ever seen. A billion salutes to you, sir. A billion Thank salutes. You. Thank you, Dr. Kiran Bedi. What a what a life of valor! What a life of total patriotic commitment. A heroic, completely, sir. Every minute of your life you have given to the nation, and we cannot in any way ever ever repay. by but by your great respect and regard and love for you and your family thank you dr kiran bedi so great to you want to say you too and your thank family too thank you sir and i'm so proud of my daughter and my entire program of demonstrative learning team they looked for you they waited for you 
they were patiently hoping that you will make it in one of our party programs and you've done it today so grateful to you sir thank you dr tirandeli god bless you thank you sir so it's our blessing we are sharing the same space with you it's blessings we'll hold on to your blessings forever and forever absolutely and hold on to them so in the yes. video we wrote and we said you you say that jay mahakali ayo gor khali so that's the essence please share the essence of that line and your journey through the 1971 war so your journey uh thank you saina the the essence of the 1971 war saina although the war commenced was conducted and was finished within 13 days it's a long story and i have told it as best as i could in my latest book 1971 stories of grit and glory so uh, i presume when you say you want to hear the story of the war you're talking about my own battalion and what happened on those fateful days Yes. So uh, that also is a long story, but I'll cut it short as best as I can. Uh, I was at the at that time at Staff College when the war broke out. I was on my way to join the unit because the second in command had been killed, and they were supposed to be there as his replacement. So I wasn't there for the first two battles where you talk about how we decimated a. a, a Pakistani company, etc. Those two battles, the Battle of Atgram and the Battle of Ghazipur, were very ferocious battles. In the first battle, my battalion, the fourth battalion, the Fifth Gurkha Rifles Frontier Force, launched the last Kukri attack in modern military history. We had come from a division which did not have artillery support, and so. The CEO, a very brave and courageous officer, Lieutenant Colonel Arun Harolekar, decided to launch a Kukri attack and take the enemy by surprise. And to cut a long story short, that night we decapitated a large number of the enemy, and those who survived ran away and told the rest, "Don't mess with the Gurkhas because you're liable to lose your head." So that's what happened at Atgram, and immediately afterwards, the co-commander was also from the third Gurkhas, and actually the war cry of my battalion is "Ayo Gurkhali." Mahakali is another battalion of the Gurkhas. Our war cry is "Ayo Gurkhali." So that night, when the battalion attacked and they launched the attack and shouted their war cry, it struck terror in the hearts. of those who were listening because they had already faced at atgram and now at gazipur where another battalion had failed the co commander said send in the gurkhas we were sent and we captured gazipur also but in the process although we had started the war with 18 officers by now we lost three officers killed and six officers wounded so the co asked for time to reorganize the battalion for the next task and he was given 4 days but the co commander general sagat singh one of the finest tactical field commanders the army has ever produced came to know or was informed that the brigade which was holding silet had moved for the defense of dhaka and there was only about 2 to 300 Razaka, that is their partially trained troops, holding on to Silet, and therefore this was the best time to go and capture Silet because he was wanting to be the first in Dhaka, and he said, "Send in the Gorkhas." The the commander, the div commander, told him, the brigade commander and the div commander told him that the battalion had suffered heavy casualties and was in the process of reorganizing. He said. there is no time to reorganize i want select captured before it is reinforced 
tell them to move immediately. Now in the army, you can protest up to a point. But after that, orders are orders, and that's that. And so the battalion went in. By this time, I, who was joining from Staff College, uh, reached uh, early morning of 8th December. On the 7th December, actually, sorry, I need to tell you what happened earlier. Uh, the battalion launched the quickest Heliborn attack in world military history. Normally, at Staff College, we are told it takes about a week before the Army and the Air Force can get their act together to launch a Heliborn attack. Here, we were told that at 7.30, 7 o'clock, you are launching a Heliborn attack today. At 9.30, a chopper will come, do a recce. At 2.30, you will go in. And that's what happened. However, what they had not catered for was that the sun sets quickly in the east. At 2.30, we were flown in. By 4.30, it was getting dark. So only two companies and the battalion headquarters had landed. And that was a strength of about 200. What we did not know was that the, the brigade, and a brigade, a battalion consists of a thousand men, approximately, on the plus side. A brigade, therefore, consists of three battalions, therefore about 3,000. So the brigade, which the corps commander said had moved to Dhaka, had not moved to Dhaka. They were still there. And to make matters worse, it was reinforced by 313 brigade, another brigade. So now there were over 6,000 troops there, plus the select garrison. So we were faced with a force 20 times our strength, as approximately 8,000. By this time, when we were fully landed on the 8th morning, we were 384. So now, luckily, we did not know. We knew that the force was overwhelming, but we fought tooth and nail. I remember something which conjures what actually happened. When I was in the IMA, we had a platoon commander called Captain Desmond Hay. Later on, he captured Dograi to carry out his own mission of what he taught us. And he taught us and said, battles are won or lost in the mind before they are lost or won on the ground. That's what he did at Dograi and that's what we did at Silhet. We fought against this overwhelming strength for nine days and nine nights. We had no food, we had no water, we had reduced ammunition, but we held the enemy at bay. Luckily for us, the BBC, a BBC war correspondent made the mistake of saying that a brigade of Gorkhazas landed at Silet. That put the enemy on the back foot. And after the ninth day, they decided to surrender. So, three brigadiers, two full colonels, 173 officers, 290 JCOs, and 8,000 approximately Pakistani troops surrendered to us. By that time, we were just 352. So, that is the Battle of Select. What is the message that is sent? The message is sent is that you need to speak up when you're given a task which you know is mission impossible. After you have spoken and you are overruled, then you have to do what you are told to do and do your best. We landed in Select. We came to know that there's an overwhelming force here. We did not know how much, but we stuck it out. We fought with this overwhelming strength of 20 to 1. And we forced them to surrender. It is not only physical courage, but moral courage, the moral ascendancy of pushing the enemy to believe that he was stronger than what we were. How did that happen? The BBC had announced by mistake that a brigade of Gurkhas has landed at Select. We pretended to be a brigade and we managed to deceive the enemy. They, were, they really thought we were a brigade and when they surrendered, when they were told it is only not only a Gurkha battalion, but an understrength Gurkha battalion. They were absolutely, they couldn't believe it. 
And we couldn't believe that we were fighting a force of Delhi, a divisional strength. This action by us helped four core to be the first to land in Dhaka. It helped the operations of four core to do what they had to do. So this is what happened at Silet in brief. So I hope I managed to cover the top China. So it's, it's so much of grit and courage and a few words, sir, your life is about courage. You say it so simply, your courage is so simple and true and pure, sir. Sir, before we ask you about no, Saini, another... I'd like, to, Saini, I'd like to say something more, that although I've been given a lot of credit, uh, I think I've been given far more than I deserve for the simple reason I was neither the battalion commander, neither was I a company commander. I was the second in command. And the second in command doesn't go around knocking heads with cookeries and launching attacks, etc. So uh, I cannot and will not take credit for what my commanding officer and the officers and the men of my brave battalion, what they did at Silet. It was an outstanding job. They completed a task which was mission impossible. But I've been given far more credit than I deserve. And therefore, I, with all humility, request you to understand this, that I was neither the battalion commander nor the company commander. I was just the second in command. I've told this story in the book 1971 and if you read it the whole story is there and I think you will enjoy it. But so, you stepped into the commander's feet because you lost the commander I believe. No, no. The commander was very much alive. He was, was Lieutenant Colonel Arun Haralekar and he right. was awarded a Mahavi Chakra for his yes. courage and leadership at the battles of Atgram Gazipur and Select. So it's your simplicity, it's your it's your love that makes your journey even more special. So what happened? You stepped on a landmine, sir. What happened that that moment yeah. when you stepped on a landmine, sir? <laughs> well, uh, I would like to say again that I am one of many, they were, when, when we were at the limb center at Pune, there were 500 of us. So every 500 of us have equally courageous stories to tell. So these things happened in war. I stepped on a mine, I lost my leg. And uh, unfortunately at that time, what had happened during the battle, the enemy artillery had destroyed our MI room, that is the medical facility that we had. The wounded who were lying inside were blown to bits. All the medi medications and the instruments were destroyed. So there was nothing to, my leg was, my foot was hanging and uh, something had to be done. There was no instruments to cut it off. So I used my Batman's cookery and I didn't hack it off. I didn't, you know, people are making it very, a big drama out of it. I just sort of uh, snipped whatever was left of it and uh, asked my batman to go and bury my foot in what was left of it. And uh, that's it. Ah, oh, I was lucky that uh, the Pakistanis who had surrendered to us, there was a surgeon, Major Muhammad Bashir, they offered to operate on me and since there was nothing else we could bank on, the CO agreed and uh, I was operated upon by Major Mohammad Bashir and he did a reasonably good job. My only regret is I've never been able to say thank you to him. Wherever he is, I hope he sees this and he knows that I'm grateful. But earlier, earlier, you made a condition that you will be only treated by an Indian doctor. 
That was one of your conditions, which was not accepted by your boss. <laughs> no, no. The CEO was very perturbed that this had happened because it was unnecessary. It should not have happened. Uh, but I said to him that I will not take Pakistani blood. So he said, don't be foolish. So I said, I'm prepared to die a fool and live with Pakistani blood. But you were finally, I think you made other conditions and conditions were rejected. But then you were asked to make a request and then your requests were accepted, right? You're right. You're right, you're right Dr. Bain. You're right. So how do you prepare for war, sir? How do you prepare for such a life? How do you prepare for challenges? How do you prepare for war? And how do you, how do you have, how do you develop moral courage, sir? And yet remain so simple with it. Yeah, this starts right in the beginning. It starts in the academy itself. When we joined the academy, we were told the motto is service before self. And that means we are here to serve, not to be served. And then when we go to the Indian Military Academy, there we are told, your country comes first. The people of India and the men you command come next. You come last always and every time. We are taught to respect our seniors. We are taught about self-sacrifice. We are taught about honor. We are taught about respect for your seniors, for old people, women, children. We are taught about commitment, dedication, preferential competence. And we are told that there's an enemy out there looking to kill you. What are you doing about it? Which means you have to train and train hard. You don't get a second chance. Uh, nobody who's not lived in the shadow of death understands what life, how precious life is. And we, I, I was fortunate to take part in three wars. And I realized that your life depends upon how well you fight. And the most important word in a soldier's dictionary is love. Now, love may not be a very, very military word, but it is on the altar of love that men and women in uniform Give their all for their country, for the people they serve, and if necessary, disappear in the smoke and fire of battle. Love of country, love of the people you serve, love of your soldiers, love of the regiment, love of the life that we live, because we believe that no other life is equal to life in the armed forces. That is our belief, and that is should be the belief of everybody in every profession. And they must make it happen. You may not be able to change the world, but you can change yourself and your immediate environment, particularly if you're a leader. And that is what we were taught. You have to stand up for what you think is right and do what is right, irrespective of consequences. And that is also what is you asked about moral courage. When I was in the NDA, in my final term, I was the academy cadet captain. And normally, the academy cadet captain is in the run for one of the medals. There are three medals, gold, silver, and bronze. So I was in the run for one of the medals. But I was asked by a very senior colonel to imitate an officer who I had a great deal of respect for. He had been in, imitated in front of officers and their wives in a social and he felt very I mean he felt he was uh, made to feel ashamed of himself because they imitated him as because he was very poor in English so I made a commitment to him that I will ensure as long as I'm the academy cadet captain I will ensure you are not imitated and now I was being told by someone much senior to him that you will imitate him. I was in a very difficult position. I was just a cadet, although I was the cadet captain. And 
my future lay in his hands. If I said no, I did not know what would happen. If I said yes, I would not be able to live with myself. So I said, I'm sorry, sir. It cannot be done. And of course, you can imagine what happened after that. But in the army, they give you a chance to explain. I was called by the commandant and asked to explain my behavior. And I told him, I said, sir, he, the commandant said, son, why are you afraid? Do you not know that at a campfire you can imitate your seniors? So I realized that this is the last time I could be able to speak. So I told the commandant, sir, if I have to be afraid of anybody, I said, I will, I'm not afraid of the major, but who should I be afraid of? The major or the colonel? And the colonel has told me that he will destroy me. He will have me relegated. He will have me withdrawn because he is the head of the branch of relegation and withdrawal. And I will never be able to pick up the pieces again. So I said, sir, who should I be afraid of? The major or the colonel? And the colonel was there standing and the commandant said to him, is that right, Colonel so-and-so? He kept quiet. The commandant had got his answer. And he said, okay, run along now. Do what you have to do. And well, as I said, there's nothing like life in the army. I not only commanded the parade, but I'm the first cadet in the history of the NDA to get both the gold and silver medal. So moral courage is as important as physical courage. And we are also taught, you would ask me, but I mean, uh, I don't know, uh, all of us who have passed out from the NDA have wonderful memories of our three years over there. And we learned a lot. Uh, and the most important thing we learn is that when you are dropped down, when you fall, you have got to get up and fight your way back again and claw yourself up to the top. And that is what happened. In my first term, I, my cycle got badly damaged. I had no cycle. I was running around the academy from riding school to drill square to PT school to main block to science block. I was late everywhere. I was on punishment every night. I used to skip breakfast and dinner because at, I was punishment was after dinner. So I lost about 11, nine and a half to 10 kgs in two months. And I was at the bottom of my course. But then I got a chance in the novices boxing. And I said, this is where I've got to make my mark. This is where I've got to redeem myself. And I fought my way up right up to the semi-final round. And I redeemed myself in the eyes of my course mates, in the eyes of my seniors, in the eyes of my officers. And they said, do not think you were alone. We were watching you and looking at how you would fight your way back. And we are glad that you survived. Now, here's your cycle and go ahead. In the next, we, we have six terms. In the next five terms, I managed to reach the top and I was first in order of merit in my final term. And as I said, I got the gold and silver medal. So the message to the youth of today is never give up, never be afraid. Take every challenge as an opportunity. So, and then I had to fight the boxing captain. That same day was the hockey finals and my squadron commander was wanting to win the inter-squadron championship. He didn't want me to fight because he knew 
the boxing captain was a killer. He won all his fights by knockouts. And uh, I was the hockey captain. So he said, you will not fight. I said, sir, I can't walk away from this. I have to fight. I, to cut a long story short, I got the thrashing of my life. And every time I fell down, I got up. But I was bleeding from my mouth, from my nose, cut above the eye. And the referee sent for the doctor to see whether I, should, I was capable of continuing the fight. And the, and the medical officer said, yes, he can continue. Then he asked me, are you wanting to fight or do you want to give up? I said, no, sir, I'll fight. Now, I think that boxing bout was instrumental in my being selected to be the academy cadet captain the following term because my seniors probably understood that this is a guy who doesn't give up. And many years later, uh, my uh, Sunit will come on board, you can ask him. My eldest son, he joined me in my regiment, in my battalion. And when the army chief, General Padmanabhan, was visiting his brigade headquarters, he came across Sunit and he said, Kado, uh, So Sunit said, Sir, he said, are you any relation to General Cardozo? He said, sir, who's he to you? He's my dad, sir. Then he said, did he tell you about the thrashing he got at the NDA? So, yeah. so he said, no, sir. Ask him. And he said, tell your dad that I was the junior most of the, I, I belong to the junior most course sitting in the workshop watching that fight. And I saw him getting thrashed, but I admire his guts because he never gave up. So, in addition to physical courage, moral courage is also important. Never giving up is very important. It's not easy to, it's easy to say, but hard to do. But nonetheless, it is something we should try to achieve. Sir, you've spoken about your family, your son. We're going to show you a part of your heart. We're going to show you your heart. A little video clip we're going to show you. And then we get your, we'll get asked Sunit then Vikram to join us. Both your sons, sir, has got three sons. Two are Vikram and Sunit are joining us today. Yeah. But sir's heart is right here. Sir, strength. And once the boys join us, then we'll again talk about a lot of a lot of thoughts crossing our minds, sir. Okay, okay. We show you your heart. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
you know, he understood what boys are all about. He taught us a lot of, you know, basic things. You're responsible for yourself. You do things yourself. You create trouble. You sort it out yourself. Don't come home and crib to anyone that this is what I have done and he thrashed me or somebody else has done something. You are responsible to sort out your own problems. And that was one thing that stood us in our lives throughout. In fact, the the greatest thing that actually mom and dad taught us was independence, responsibility, and dependability. They told us at the age of 21, you're on your own. Don't look back. Don't look back. We're not going to give you anything. We've educated you. We've given you your base. Work on it. For that matter, even for me to join the armed forces, it was my entirely my own choice. We had exposure for everything. Dad just told me one thing when I decided, you know, I told him that rather I'd like to go for the armed forces. He told us, you are joining the army on your own accord. It's your choice. Don't look back. Don't look back at me and tell me I forced you or I told you to do that. You're doing it on your own. And once you join the armed forces or you join the army, navy, air force, whatever it is, you are responsible for whatever you do. You can look at me for advice. I'll give you advice, whatever advice you want. But don't ask me to help you in anything. And that is what actually stood out stood with us throughout our life. In fact, even my younger brothers, both Arun and Vikram, they were also given their choices. They did whatever they wanted. One became a doctor and of course, Vikram is there. He joined GE and went on. And the greatest thing, the greatest thing that he did for us was give us exposure in the armed forces. The facilities we had, the camaraderie we we had with all dad's parents, or rather dad's friends, and their children who also rather joined the academy with us. And we became course mates, some of them six months senior, six months junior, and we continued to be in touch. And that's something that the armed forces can give you. It's fantastic. It's super. I've served Six ten years in JNK. I've seen the most beautiful places that I mean we can imagine. We didn't have to go abroad. I've seen beautiful places, done the most beautiful things. I've served in Siachen, I've served in on the rather in the Chinese front, that is in uh, the Pengong Su, that area. I've served in Sri Lanka, I've served on a UN mission in in Sudan. I've had Tremendous exposure. And I thank dad for everything he's done. He never molly coddled us. Both he and mom were very, very firm with us. Yes, we also were rascals when we were young. And that, of course, all children do. But we learned to live with all these values. Vikram can carry on from there. Thanks, Sunit. Uh, you know, Dr. Bedi and Saina, you know, um, I think Sunit summed it up well. But a few things. Um, you know, dad was always dad for us, right? He, we never saw him as anything different. He was strict. He was tough um, when we were kids because, you know, he was not one person to be messed with. But then when you have three boys, uh, you have to be that way. He was often posted far away at non-family stations with mom often, like Sunit said, playing the role of mom and dad you know, for us over the years. And she was tough too. Um, and as we grew up, you know, dad became more understanding, a bit of a friend and, and, and remains so till today. Uh, there's a couple of things I'll add to what Sunit said. You know, dad taught us how to swim, box, play basketball, hockey, squash, horse riding, shooting weapons, uh, you know, driving, etc. We never felt in any way that dad was disabled. You know, uh, in fact, he did everything normally, even till today. He drives us you know, a car with a stick shift 
using his prosthetic leg for the clutch. Um, he doesn't drive an automatic, right? So, you know, besides all these things, Sunit touched upon it. I think most importantly, he, along with mom, taught us our values and the importance of values uh, in ensuring that we make the right choices in life. He always said that, you know, they would always be various influences uh, and choices, often driven by peer pressure. But if you have a foundation of the right values and behaviors, we make the right choices. Things like honesty, integrity, uh, humility, respect, trust, teamwork, team before self. Dad talked about service before self, but team before self, positivity, hard work, and a good work ethic. Uh, and, and these were the foundations that he set for us, um, of course, along with mom, right? It, it, was, a, it was a joint thing because um, we spent a lot of time with mom while dad was away, but we also spent a lot of time as a family. I think the other thing that stays with us today uh, is the stress, you know, on the fact that we always have to treat people with respect. Never treat people differently because of what they do or their financial status or because of their social status. All that matters is that people are people and that they do an honest day's work. And whatever they do, they do the, to the best of their ability. So treat people the way you would like to be treated and you will always do the right thing. I was tough, right? you know, and, he, and let's be very clear. We were scared of him, right? Uh, we were scared of mom too. Let's be very clear. Mom was a school teacher, taught 50 boys in school. I met one of my classmates just a month ago and he, he's still scared of her. All right. <laughs> so, so we, you know, we see both mom and dad as tough, but we needed that. And that has made a big difference in our life. But dad was also caring, right? I remember I, I, I was in a swimming competition. I was rushed to hospital for an emer emergency appendectomy. And dad was about to head back to his division in Jammu. And, um, you know, a few days later, but an infection set in and I had to stay in the hospital for a month, quite ill, very ill in fact. And dad stayed back for three weeks after that till I was discharged. Um, and then the night he got back, when I was discharged a couple of days later, he left, he got back to Jammu and that very night at about seven o'clock, he went to the office and started looking at some incursions that were occurring from our friends from across the, our not so friendly neighbors. And he went and pushed them back and sorted out the issue in a couple of days. So a caring father and an extremely conscientious army officer, you know, who served his country. So many other things, but uh, you know, I have a few more things. To, I'll give some examples later on, maybe if, uh, you know, if you have the time about some of the things, uh, where we've learned and I have used these lessons in my life till today in the workplace. Sir, how does it feel, sir? Sir, well, uh, how does it feel hearing your, uh, your uh, own Yeah, it, it is good hearing them because, and it is, I thank you for bringing them onto this program. Uh, but I'd like to add to what both of them said, and that is, the rock on which our family was built was Priscilla, my wife. And what I'd like to tell people is that when choice, your choice is very important. Choice of your profession is very important. You need to do what you love and love what you do. And the next thing I'd like to say is choice of your partner is very important. And I was very, very lucky to have Priscilla as my partner. Both of us made a big sacrifice for the boys. We were, the boys were in a good school, St. Columbus in Delhi, and both of us decided that it would be better if I continue to serve in operational areas so that they could continue their education. Well, for me, it was not very different, difficult because I always had somebody to look after me. But she had a very tough time. We were away from each other. What is marriage all about? We were away from each other. And she had to look after not only the family, but these three boys, naughty fellows, and also teach in the school. But she never looked at it that way. Early in the morning, she used to drive them to school. 
put them in the swimming pool. After class, again she should make them swim. She made them show. She made sure they were the professional, competent swimmers, and all of them are outstanding swimmers. Vikram was number two in India at 17 and a half uh, in the 50 meters freestyle. He was the best swimmer in the national meet in Delhi. So, all due to her. She gave them the educational background they needed. She gave them the values that they needed. And being a mother and father both, I can assure you, is not easy. So, uh, both the boys have said so. But I would like to add to them and say, she's been my rock. And now that the boys are away with their own families, she is there, my support. My, she is my philosopher, friend and guide, encouraging me to do whatever I have to do in every, in every possible way. So, I'm lucky. Isn't this, isn't this, in fact, isn't it a fact, isn't it a fact that the spouses, in your case, your wife, and wives of the army, armed forces, actually are the real they are handling the forts while you are handling the borders and dealing with the enemies and securing the country they are handling your forts in fact when government of india or people of india engage with you employ any one of you actually they employ two they employ you or they engage with you but also get one plus one one who's going to handle your fort isn't it isn't it general Carter? absolutely dr kiran bedi you are absolutely 100 percent right uh, we do what we do only because we have wives who are there to support us through thick and thin and uh, i think army wives and mothers need to get better recognition for what they do if the armed forces do what they do, it's only because of the families that stand behind us. And that too, particularly in war. In war, they have no idea what is happening. Where is my husband? Where is he now? When I got wounded, uh, army headquarters sent a very dispassionate telegram to say, husband has been wounded, evacuated to so-and-so hospital. She had no idea as to where was I wounded, how was I wounded, when was I wounded, what had happened, which part of me was wounded. And this continued for I was evacuated from one hospital to another. Be glad to inform you. Hmm? Be glad to inform you. And, the, and the telegram starts with the word, words uh, which I think no one should hear. It starts off with saying, regret to inform you that I see so-and-so, major so-and-so, wounded so-and-so. So this is the sort of telegram no wife likes to receive. But still, through it all, she kept my three boys happy, secure. And when I lost my leg, uh, Sunit will remember, I don't know whether he does, he was a young boy of five at that time. He told his mother, Mom, what will my friend say? My dad has become a langra. And she had to reassure him and say, Son, remember, the father lost his leg for the country. The father is a hero. Don't ever forget that. And Vikram, who was just, I think, a year and a half old, he wanted his leg like his daddy's. And said, Mom, I want a leg like Daddy's leg. So, you know, each of them, uh, the, the middle boy, Arun, took life as it came. And all three have grown up into their respective perspectives in the same manner. But although they are totally different in every way, they are also just the same. And they are just the same and totally different only because of their mother. They are what they are today because of her and 
I don't, I, I will never ever say that I was a good father to them. I'm sorry, I was never there. It was she who was there. She was there always to handle their bruises, their problems, their schoolwork. If they got punished in school, they got a double, double dose at home. <laughs> so the point is that choice of profession and choice of partner, both are very important. I'd like one other thing I'd like to say is a short story which I don't know dad whether you will remember or not okay and this is about you know when we grow up in life we all learn about these management things about leadership and empowerment and I remember once we were visiting dad in Jammu and mom and I were there on holiday and and our friendly our unfriendly neighbors used to get a lot of arms and ammunition from other countries and as a result, they would just keep shooting at our troops indiscriminately with no accountability. And sometimes they would hit and injure our soldiers, but we would not respond. And, and so one day dad went there with mom and I, and his presence and her presence was a big morale booster for the troops. However, this time he found them very dejected. So he asked them, you know, what is the issue here? And they said, Sab, they keep shooting at us. We cannot shoot back. We ask for permission. It is always denied. It's very bureaucratic. By the time permission is asked by the company, the battalion, the brigade, the division, the corps, the command, army headquarters, defense ministry, we get an answer back three days later and they say, no, you start off a war if you shoot back. So how stupid is that? They can shoot us, no war, we'll shoot them, war will start. We are sitting ducks and this only encourages them to shoot us many, much more. We are very frustrated. And this is when I saw leadership in action. He turned to the troops and he said, is that the only problem? It's a small matter. From now on, you have my permission to shoot back. But I give you two conditions. Shoot only if they shoot first. And you are shooting in self-defense, number one. Number two, ek goli, ek dushman. I don't want you to waste bullets. I want to see one body for every bullet you fire. So don't shoot indiscriminately. Focus. Let them you know you mean business. Let them know you mean business. And they will stop this bloody nonsense. It was amazing to see the soldiers' eyes light up. Some of the other officers had to protest and say, you will cause a war and things will flare up. But he just said, listen, I'll be responsible for that. You just ensure that the troops have what they need and there's no indiscriminate fire. That's all. The next day they were shot at and they took out three people from the other side. There was a big drama. The other side objected and it was but we made it a point that if you fire, don't you have to learn to expect to be fired back at. Don't think this is a joke. Don't take it lightly. From then onward, for the next two years, while dad was there, there was peace and quiet and no more such firings. And it changed the game completely. They learned to respect us. They feared us. And they learned how to keep things in check. That's leadership comes with responsibility and empowerment. I look at this thought all the way to my life, even till today, as a learning for me. But I learned as a teenager, just watching dad in action as a leader. That's where you get a lot of learning from. So just kind of one you know, quick story to share. Dad may not remember. No, I do remember. <laughs> That's it. That's called decisive. Decisive leadership. And the welfare, it's a true leadership. It's welfare of the of the men is a priority. Welfare and taking and being able to defend your own decisions. Indeed. And not to attack, but to save life. It's not to kill others, but to protect your own selves. This is leadership. So wonderful, Ian, a doctor, uh, uh, General, that that's why the whole country looks up to you and salutes you all the way. The bravest of and the brave. I would like to say about, uh, you asked about army wives. The army wives, the CO's wife, is the mother of the battalion. And uh, as you grow up in seniority, when you become the mother of the brigade and the division, etc. And my wife made it a point to know the names 
of every Jawan and their wives and their children. And it wasn't easy. She used to come home, open her notebook, write down everything so they wouldn't forget. And the next time, probably a year later, when she went back to the Paltan for Dasera or whatever, she would call the children by their first names and the men and the women and the wives, they all used to clap. And sometimes they should bring somebody in front of her and say, Mataji, what's your name? And she would answer and they would all be so happy. So uh, she learned the basics of man management in the sense that everybody likes to call her names. And she was really the mother of my troops. So army wives and army mothers are the backbone of the Indian armed forces. Without them, we cannot do what we do. Yes, sir. May you always be united in this love for eternity, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Saina. For eternity. There's so much of love in your eyes and your words. So you're writing a book, sir? Kartu Sahab? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, Saina, I, I am. You are writing that book, sir? So I wanted to ask Sunit, how does it feel that your father actually carved the way for people who have suffered battle casualties? If they train and if they can come back, they can lead the force. He's taught, he's taught us. He said, a true soldier does not take shelter of his wounds. He's, he said that. And he's carved well, the way, he's written history. Saina, perhaps uh, Sunit may not be able to, uh, I, I have never shared this uh, with him or with uh, the children as such. So I'd, uh, if, I, if I may, I'd answer it myself. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Please, please, sir. Please. Yeah. So uh, when I was in hospital, firstly, when I joined the Gurkhas, I could think of no other life. And when I was told that you've lost a leg and now you can't go back to the troops, it was very demoralizing, but I felt it was a challenge and I had to fight this issue because I wanted with all my soul, with all my heart, with all my mind to go back to my Paltan. But I had no idea as to how this would happen at all because the army headquarters, their rules and regulations are very strict. How would I, as a single young major who lost a leg, fight the system? I had no idea. But I decided to take one day at a time. And when opportunities presented themselves, I had mentally prepared that I would take on every challenge and make it into an opportunity to prove that I, I was as good as people with two legs. So when I joined Army Headquarters, and there was an announcement made for the physical PPET tests, that is, physical tests to test us as to whether we were fit. To cut a long story short, in the two mile run, I was ahead of seven officers who were with two legs. And the officer conducting the program was very impressed. And he wrote a note about me to my superiors. This impressed them. And luckily, I was in military operations, which is very close to the vice chief and the chief. I came in contact with them. And the director of military operations, General Vaidya Mahavi Chakra and Ba, he said, which battalion did you command? So I said, sir, I'm not commanded a battalion. So he said, why? I said, because this is the cause. He said, what's the problem? I said, the problem is with my senior officers. They have not given me a chance or an opportunity to prove that I'm as good as anybody else. So he says, you apply for command of a battalion. So I applied and the vice chief, number two to the chief, uh, I was in MO, so I was, whenever he goes to visit the forward troops, a staff officer has to go with him. So the, the director of military operations sent me along. And while he was visiting the troops in a, in a chopper, I was going down below in a jeep. 
And at the final picket, I realized that a, friend, a, a battalion officer of mine was commanding that post. So I climbed. I climbed about, I think, I don't know, about 2,800 to 3,000 feet. And when the vice chief landed in a chopper, he said, how did you get here? He thought being an NDA guy, with my links with the Air Force course mates, I got a chopper. I said, uh, I was a little perplexed. I said, sir, I climbed. He said, you can climb? I said, sir, what I cannot do lies in the minds of my senior officers. He said, don't be cheeky. What do you mean? I said, sir, my senior officers have not given me a chance or an opportunity to prove that I'm as good as anybody else. So he took this to the chief. The chief was General Reiner. The vice chief was General Vora. And the chief was General Reiner. General Reiner himself had lost an eye in World War II, so he knew what disability meant. He said, send Cardozo with me to Ladakh. I went to Ladakh, I clambered over snow and ice. He called for my file then and said, yes, give him a battalion and other war disabled officers who are not taking shelter of their wounds. He didn't have to run to the bureaucrats or the politician. He was a chief and he acted like that. And he gave a direction and I got a battalion. But in my euphoria to command a battalion, because that was what my aim was, he was denied promotion beyond Lieutenant Colonel's rank. So when I got approved for Brigadier, I informed the then chief that I had been approved for command for the appointment of Brigadier, but not being given command of a brigade because there's no precedent. And the next chief also didn't run to the bureaucrats and the politician. He said, if there's no precedent, create one. If he can command a battalion, there's no reason why he can't command a brigade because higher standards of physical fitness are required in lower ranks. And that opened up promotion for the whole army and three officers became army commanders, which is one rank below the chief. So I'm the guinea pig, which opened up promotion for battle casualties. And that story perhaps Sunit does not know, but it is known now. <laughs> Sir, we, the army will always be blessed because of your act of courage. You've opened the way, you've carved the way for them. Just final thoughts now, sir, because we've completed our time and it's been so wonderful hearing you and getting your blessings. Vikram, just words of love for your father. Sunit, words of love for your father and then we, we keep in touch and we close the program. Yeah, so I won't take long. The final message to the, to the youth who's listening is uh, do what you love, which means choose your profession wisely. Having chosen and, and you are doing what you love, then love what you do, which means you've got to be the best. That doesn't mean you've got to compete with others. You've got to compete with yourself. Your competence, your professional competence, your courage, your determination, commitment, dedication have to be of a very high order and particularly leadership, leadership in battle. And I haven't spoken about it, but the, co the code word, the, the slogan is follow me. The young officer doesn't say, Tum aage jao, main piche aa rao. he says, Mere piche move. And the, the uh, young officers are the highest, we have the highest casualty rate of officers in the, any army in the world. So, do what you love, love what you do, never be afraid, never give up. Do what is right, irrespective of the consequences. And remember, battles are won or lost in the mind before they are won or lost on the ground. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your blessing. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you, Dr. Lady. Very inspirational. And it's come on the on the heels of having celebrated our Republic Day. How coincidental. We kept losing you a month. I think earlier a month we could not. We missed you, uh, General. Yes. But we missed yes. you. And we I didn't know it would come on as a follow-up to the Republic Day. How appropriate. Most appropriate. Thank you. Thank you.
Vikram, thank you for joining us. Sunit, thank you for joining us and sharing thank your you thoughts so and your love for thank your Thank you partner. for having us on the program. Thank you. Thank Our you. pleasure. Thank you so much. It's wonderful. And thank you to yeah. mom and dad too for everything you've done. Everything yeah. you've made us. Thank you. We love this family, gallant, gallant families reminiscence. A gallant families reminiscence. It's been a wonderful get together with generals together. It's generals and commanders and leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you sir. You, thank you for your blessing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank, you. thank you, Saina. Yes, thank sir. you, Shakira. <laughs> yes, sir. And a lot of regard to ma'am. A lot of regard. We seek her blessings too. A lot of regard to her. I'll tell her. Thank you. Thank you, Saina. A lot I'll of tell regard to her, sir. Total thank admiration you. for her. Total thank admiration you so for your mother and total admiration for your wife. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Baby. God bless you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. मिलेंगे आपको अगले महीने एक और बातचीत के साथ आज आपने सर से जाना how he has lived life with complete grit हर पल उन्होंने जिया है बहादुरी के साथ करेज के साथ and he just keeps saying I've just done the right thing he makes it sound so simple he makes courage sound so simple thank you sir Thank you. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you, Saina. Thank you, Saina, for giving me this opportunity. God bless you. Thank Take you, care. Thank you, sir. Jai Dhari. God bless you. Jai Dhari.